Uh, my name is Geert Jan. I'm also one of the people involved in um, setting up um, setting up this event. Um, and I'd like to um, briefly introduce the next speaker, um, who is Max. So Dr. Max Lane is currently a guest lecturer in politics at Gaja Mada University in Yogyakarta. He's the author of several books on Indonesia and the translator of the novels of Pramudya Nantatur and the plays and poems of W.S. Render. He has been visiting Indonesia and active in political solidarity with Indonesian progressive activists for 48 years, since 1970. In the 1980s, he founded Inside Indonesia magazine. In the 1990s, he was national coordinator of action in solidarity with Indonesia and East Timor, ASEAN, whose Dutch partner was Solitim. Throughout the 1980s until 2007, he also wrote regularly for Green Left Weekly newspaper. His next book, due for publication in July this year, is An Introduction to the Politics of Indonesian Unions. His book, Unfinished Nation, Indonesia Before and After Suharto, has been recently reprinted by Verso Books. Max is going to um, introduce his topic for about half an hour, and then we're going to again have a discussion of about half an hour after that. So, Max. Good afternoon, everybody. Great to see so many people uh, here today. This is my topic, colonialism legacy in Indonesia today. And I'm going to have to speak fast and be very, and only touch on a small number of issues that relate to Indonesia's legacy, uh, colonialism's legacy in Indonesia today. It's a very big topic. We only have half an hour. I should make my overall view clear to you first. That is, has there been any positive legacy of colonialism in any of the European colonial powers in Asia, Africa, Latin America, including Indonesia? So just to be know from the start, in my view, there is zero positive legacy uh, of colonialism. Now, <coughs> how is it? I'm, I'm an Australian. I've been living most of my life in Australia. Uh, as Gertian said, a lot of that has been involved in political activity in solidarity with movements for changes in Indonesia. I've spent a reasonable amount of time living in Indonesia, although I'm still majority of the time in, in Australia. How come this question of the colonial legacy has led me to be part of this process of talking here today. The reason is this. Over the last, especially since the heart of well, over the last 10 years in particular, when I'm talking to students at Gajamada University or at other universities, or in activist forums in the various cities that, uh, of Java and Sumatra and elsewhere, Amongst the most radical, critical, and active young people, the frustration is about the state of their country. What's the reason, what's the causes, and what are the solutions for the poverty, the widening gap between rich and poor, and the sense amongst many that development is not going to take place? even though the elites of Indonesia on both sides of politics keep saying, or one side in particular keeps saying, we are going to be a, a huge economy and a powerful country by the year 2045. Many young people just don't believe it. Now, one of the manifestations of this, in the, in the session this morning, there was some discussion of language. There's one Indonesian word which between the 1970s and 1997, 1998, was a word that almost had magical power. And that was the word pembangunan, meaning development. But since 1998, you, can't, you can hardly find the word pembangunan or development anymore. Sahata was Bapa, the pembangunan, father of development. 
one of the most prominent cabinet ministers would always be the Minister for Development Planning. I doubt whether many Indonesians even know the name of the minister holding that position in the country. Pembangunan is stuck, finished. Where is the country going? If you're not in the crowd that thinks the, pre the, the current president's promises of a great country by 2045 don't ring through, what's, what's the reason for this? Amongst activists, especially those who have already moved in a left-wing direction, they think neoliberalism, neoliberal capitalism, the policies of Suharto, the policies of governments since Suharto, these are the causes of the poverty and economic factors. So in my opinion, of course, the policies of Suharto and the policies of governments since Suharto have not helped the Indonesian social and economic <coughs> They have not helped. In many respects, they have made the situation worse. But they're not the causes, they're not the origins of the, situ of the situation that, that Indonesia experiences now. What is ex Indonesia's experience? Well, like most third world countries that were once colonized or dominated by colonial powers, you can see Indonesia. Can you see Indonesia there? <coughs> it's uh, no, not very really clear, but it's about here. In the in the uh, per capita income, between three and four thousand dollars U.S. dollars a year per capita, compared to U.S. Australia and so on. You can, perhaps this is clearer. You can see here, Indonesia is down here in the various hierarchies of wealth in the world today. Netherlands second second layer after Australia, Singapore, USA in terms of per capita income. Indonesia here about four thousand. Can this four thousand catch up to fifty thousand? Not with current economic and the economic strategies. And just to remind you, because we'll get to this a bit later as well, when, we, when you, those who know economics are, are won't be telling you anything you don't know, but it's worth emphasizing that 4,000 US dollars per capita per year is not the individual's income. It's just a gross domestic product divided by population. So that $4,000 a year not only has to finance everybody's clothing, housing, food, etc. It has to finance the whole of the development of the country. Well, you can think 4,000 US, about 4,000 euros. What can you do with that? So the Indonesian per capita income is still very well, low. Indonesia today still has no heavy industry. There's not si one single factory in Indonesia that can produce significant quantities of plant and machinery. All machinery, virtually all uh, medium and large machinery, has to be imported. 90% of workers still work in, in, in workplaces with less than 20 or even less than 10 employees. It's what Sukarno, in one of his best writings in the 1920s, when he described in the, in, in the Dutch East Indies economy, it's a commonly characterized as far as the, the Indonesian people's activities go, Merk <coughs> Kachil. Everything was small. Enterprises were small, wages were small, everything was small. And in many cases, that's still the case today. See, only 16% of 130 million workers <coughs> work in what's described as manufacturing. But that's mainly assembly plant and factories with 100 people, 200 people, not using the advanced technology at all. Education. Of course, today everybody, almost everybody goes to school, which has been the case since the 1950s, and that, is an, that in itself is an enormous achievement when we see the colonial legacy, get onto it in a minute. And, but while everyone goes to school, the, the poverty of the country, the low GDP income, means that, there's, for example, there's only 94,000 libraries for 148,000 primary schools. And most libraries have very few books. Teachers are underpaid. 
And perhaps worst of all, the curriculum that now applies in most schools in Indonesia comes out of the new order, the culture, the culture of dictatorship, where everything must be learned off by heart and where answers are either right or wrong, just like in politics. <laughs> Indonesia scores the fourth worst for 15-year-olds in mathematical and science, science skills, according to OECD, OECD studies reviewing the, the status of students. 75% are below international standards. It's at the bottom of the literacy in the same study uh, of the, the state of students. Literacy not meaning uh, illiterate, but meaning uh, not used to or not in the habit of dealing with complex comprehension work. 40, only 40% 40 of the workforce, uh, sorry, 40% of the workforce only has primary school education. So <coughs> Indonesia is, has become integrated into the global capitalist economy to grow and also to develop, of course we can debate what develop actually means. Under capitalism, you must have large amounts of capital. <coughs> Under capitalism, to develop, to grow, you need capital. That's the, that's the essence of the, one, one of the key fundamental essences of, this, of the, the, the uh, system. But to accumulate capital, to produce capital, you must be able to build all the productive mechanisms you need. Schools, infrastructure, factories, large-scale industrial things. To need that, you need capital, money, in large, large quantities. If you study economics, you'll see that in the 21st century, the average cost of building a modern industrial plant is now huge. And, and gets bigger and bigger. <coughs> so you call it in the Indonesia's court and it develops a, a vicious circle. To develop, you need huge, huge amounts of capital. To gener generate such capital, you need high levels of productivity, which requires high levels and large-scale industry with advanced technology. But Indonesia starts off or started off in 1950 with no capital and no industry. Today, it still remains dependent on foreign investments and loans. So presidents of Indonesia, one of the first things they have to do is go overseas, make speeches saying, invest, invest, invest. Even after that, however, foreign investment that goes into Indonesia is still tiny compared to what's needed to develop and modernize a, a country of 260 million people. And of course, during this whole process since the 1960s of trying to obtain foreign investment, the process of obtaining it and using it is always supervised by former colonizing countries. In Indonesia's case, from the, late, from the early 70s right through uh, until, until Sahata fell basically, there was a meeting every year of the World Bank, the IMF, all of the Western governments in The Hague, hosted by the Dutch government, to check over how well the Sahato regime was doing economically in their eyes, and then to decide how much aid Indonesia would or would not get. I think it's ironic that this process of monitoring how the uh, Indonesian economy was being administered by the Sahata dictatorship, that, took, that takes place in the Hague all that time. <coughs> so why is Indonesia caught in this trap? Is it the responsibility of the various Indonesian governments? Well, I think, as I said earlier, partly yes, but one of the, one, in my view, the fundamental framework in which they operate, in which the Sahata government operated, and governments since then, since they don't question, they've never questioned whether the, 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 the economic situation they had as a legacy of colonialism, they never questioned that, they accepted it as legitimate, as a legitimate starting point. In fact, within the Indonesian political scene in the 1950s, that was one of the biggest debates. <laughs> Has the revolution finished so that we can now integrate into the world economy and develop that way, 
or is the revolution not finished? Is the national revolution not finished? And of course, in 1965, it was it was determined, or that when Sahata took power, the revolution was considered over. In fact, it was suppressed with about one million killings and tens of thousands imprisoned, and a big spectrum of Indians in politics suppressed. There are two ways, I think, to look at th this question of legacy, and I'm going to, because of restricted time, I'm going to concentrate on the economic aspects. And it's, of course, an issue that applies throughout the Third World. <coughs> I try to put myself in Indonesian political leaders' shoes in the year 1950. Why 1950? Because that's after the Dutch colonial military forces and most of the Dutch bureaucracy leave Indonesia. From 1945 until 1949, the Indonesian political leadership and Indonesian people are focused on getting rid of the Dutch. Once 1950 arrived, they can turn their attention towards we now are an independent country, how should we develop it? But I put in red there the midpoint of the 20th century because I know when I teach students in Indonesia or in Australia or in the US, this time issue doesn't quite get into people's heads. We're talking, when I, when I talk, of, give some figures in a moment, but we have to remember we're talking about the middle of the 20th century when Western Europe, Japan, the United States, when their industrial output was capable of producing everything needed for the horrible Second World War. The thousands and thousands of planes, the tens of thousands of jeeps, the hundreds of thousands of guns, the millions of ammunition, the ships, the submarines, the aircraft carriers. All of that, they were the Western countries and Japan were already capable of doing in the 1930s. So, the first thing I want to point to is what did Indonesia, what did the Netherlands colonial period take out of Indonesia? What was the drain? <coughs> I'm using figures by Dr. Ali Gordon. He's got several articles in the Journal of Contemporary Asia and if you're interested in this question, you should go to those. But the total figure over the period from 1880 to 1940, 56,900 million guilder taken out. 56,900 million guilder at with the value of that time. If you look at uh, today's value, you're talking about this amount of euros. Five, whatever it is. I'm using the <coughs> calculations from the International Institute of Social History. In the last 20 years of Dutch occupation, they took out 34,000 million euros. Of course, maybe economists will debate exactly how much it was this way or that way, but we're basically talking about a huge, huge, huge amount of wealth drained out of the East Indies. But one way, and you, when you think of those numbers, you think, what does that mean? How do we get, how do we get you know, what, what's that mean in, 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 real, in real life? One way to get, I thought, maybe compare it to this or maybe compare it to that, but I think one way to get a feel for this is to ask the question, after taking out so much, what was left? After taking out so much, how much was left? What was left in the I'm taking some data here from this industrial development in the Netherlands Indies, which it comes from the Netherlands Indies government itself in the 1930s. Well, <coughs> that booklet says industrial development. 
But if we look at the areas that production was taking place in, if you look at the number of factories, but yep, important if you look at the number of people working in each factory, we're not really talking about modern and remember. Otherwise, you, if you don't remember this, you can miss the point. We're talking about 1930s, middle of the 20th century. What sort of factories existed in Western Europe, Japan and America then, or, and Australia for that matter? Not wasn't dominated by workplaces whose average number of employees was 59 and producing only these kinds of products tanning metal very little metal things you know it's not a modern mid 20th century economy <coughs> and the total number of people 324,000 employed in manufacturing out of a population of 70 million. Basically, even in the 1930s, after 300 years of domination by Dutch colonialism and, and 100 or more years of direct administered <laughs> colonialism, nothing. It's nothing. And you have to underline the nothing when you remember this is 1930, 1940. It's not 19th century you're talking about. <coughs> income industrial workers. Annual income, 318 guilda. Also nothing, just like Sukarno said, micro. Everything's micro. <coughs> maybe, it, is there lights on or? So wait to darken the room a bit, maybe. Maybe those curtains? <laughs> so you can imagine with with uh, that kind of manufacturing, <coughs> the development of urban centres is is uh, uh, very very uh, very small. These ones all under 20, 30,000 uh, population. Even Batavia, still a very small, a very small population. So you still got, again, in the middle of the 20th century, basically a village society. And we have to keep thinking of, the, of the, that time thing, because what was, what was the Netherlands like in the 1930s? He is schooling. <coughs> the top one is the percentage of children in school. You can see, you know, below 7%, below 5%, below 2%. It's like Francisca said in the interview this morning. You get 5% of the population in the 1930s going to school. How many children were going to school in the Netherlands at the same time? Probably 100%. <coughs> This is the figures for, for uh, women, girl students, even lower. And again, it's not, there's two things I think, because the figures you have to keep putting them in a framework. One, this is the middle of the 20th century. And two, these schools were not built, the education was not given by a colonial power that took out that huge, 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 huge amount of wealth in the first place. Literacy also, this is in 1930. Well, again, for the, in the 1930s, it's a miserable <coughs> record. So, Almost no manufacturing. First of all, massive amount of wealth drained out. <coughs> Secondly, at, with draining out so much wealth, of course you can't develop industry. You just have these small workshops, small enterprises in very low technology, <coughs> low productivity <coughs> areas, only involving a few hundred thousand people out of a population of 70 million. 
So you've already got a really bad situation. Then of course comes the war. <coughs> First the Japanese occupation, which destroys even more of Indonesia's productive cap capacity. Although, as in Francis's interview this morning, there was an elevation of the, the role of Indonesian language with, with the banning of the Dutch. And of course, t tens of thousands, if not more, hundreds of thousands of people killed and also starved. That Japanese occupation is followed by the colonial aggression against Indonesia. As Jan Bremen said this morning, leaving the country shattered. Infrastructure shattered, everything shattered. So, colonialism, first of all, drains out this huge amount, leaves nothing significant, certainly nothing that's anywhere near sufficient to develop a country that becomes independent in the middle of the 20th century. And then, wages the colonial war which smashes more infrastructure. <coughs> and not only that, as, as Michael explained in this morning's session, the colonial power also insists on, on the, the Republic of Indonesia, or the, the new Indonesian state, pay back a huge debt. So Indonesia becomes one of the few larger countries in the world that from day one had a massive foreign debt was not a foreign debt that the new republic accumulated, it was from day one, or minus day one even. It starts off as life. No industry, no schools, no full universities, low literacy, no money because it's all gone out, plus a debt. So, <coughs> Basically, su su summing up, summing up here. I think uh, <coughs> what can you say? You know, a country of almost one hundred million people becomes <coughs> independent after a long struggle, <coughs> costing lives, people being imprisoned requiring enormous courage and political organization. Finally, it gets independence, looks to the question of how to advance the country, and it has to, has to start, like many colonial countries, stable countries, with almost nothing. <coughs> how can it possibly develop? I remember interviewing uh, from Mundian at the tour for a documentary about him. And he made this point. From Mundian, most of you know, one of, one of Indonesia's greatest writers, if not the greatest. He said, Max, <coughs> Indonesia can never ever develop properly without all of the wealth that Europe took being given back. It has to come back. Otherwise, we, we sti simply don't have enough capital. We don't have enough money to build the country. And that was an expression, basically, of, of his sentiment about this question. Also, need to emphasize this. One of the agreements made made by the Republican government or to be with the Dutch was that Dutch capitalists could come back to the East Indies, come back to Republic to Indonesia and repossess all of the plantations, all of the mines, all of the businesses that, had, that, that they had been able to develop during, during the colonial period when, as Jan Bremen mentioned, they didn't have to pay they often didn't have to pay income tax. They could use the cheapest possible labor, even slave labor, what was basically, in fact, slave labor during much of the period. So all of those companies, plantations, mines, all sorts of all kinds of businesses that they were able to develop because of the colonial conditions 
that applied. <coughs> they were allowed to have bank. So from 1950 until uh, they were nationalized, when workers themselves occupied the companies and took them over, from that first six or seven years of Indonesia's uh, period of not having to wage war against the Dutch, most of the decisions about what would be produced and not produced were still made by Dutch private capital, which was another reason why the Indonesian economy, uh, economy had a lot of problems during the 1950s. <coughs> I think I made this point before, just to remind people again that <coughs> you, we can talk about all these figures, put up some of this data, which is just a uh, tip of the iceberg, really. But the way to, to me to, to, to capture it is to compare it with the, the industrial and productive capacity of the countries that were colonial powers at approximately the same time. I mean, to all intents and purposes, in terms of a large modern factory, if you exclude sugar mills and tobacco mills, there wasn't really any modern factory in Indonesia at the time of independence. Yet the factories in the West and Japan could produce that massive output for World War II, unbelievably huge output, which they, of course, except in Germany and Japan's case, Ameri America still had that capacity after, after uh, World War II and was able to assist Western Europe and Japan to rebuild. So, just to also make a point that uh, Francisca made and also Jan Bremen, it's, it's not only socioeconomics, it's also in the political culture. I mean, the new order, Sahata's new order, is known as a military dictatorship. So it's basically a, a modern police state dictatorship. But as Jan Bremen said, that's what the East Indies had become in the 20th century. Colonialism set the example of having a non-elected head of government, Governor General. Nobody elected the Governor General. During the colonial period, the slogan of the colonial power was Rust and Order, correct? Stability and Order, which became the slogan of the new order under Sahato. <laughs> there was a racially based legal hierarchy underpinned by the racist ideology that Jan Raymond talked about. But that racist ideology also underpinned a class approach. So if you were in the feudal class, legally, for example, you had more rights than uh, uh, people not in the feudal class, although in the day-to-day -day discrimination, as uh, we saw in the interview in the morning, that uh, racial discrimination still controlled. Then under, under colonialism, of course, Political parties were controlled, press, the press was controlled, even public meetings uh, were tightly controlled by the colonial state. So all those precedents were already set during the colonial period. So, okay, I'm going to finish with just a comment about solutions. I agree with Pramudia, basically, in terms of sentiment. For countries, third world countries that were, that were poor, poverty-stricken when they got independence. A crucial thing for their advance is for the wealth that was taken out of them, out from them to be returned. I think in, in the rich colonial, ex-colonial countries, there should be movements to demand this. Return what was taken out. And the first concrete step which there's always already been movements in 10 years ago or so, cancel the third world's debt. That's the first concrete step that should be taken. But it should be taken in the context of recognizing that this wealth has to go back. But within the countries concerned, like Indonesia, I think <coughs> there's also going to have to be a political movement that also demands that return. And it's very conscious of the need to fight for sovereignty. 
And the, the sovereignty, the loss of sovereignty is not be simply because there are foreign companies in Indonesia, for example, or that foreign co companies own plantations. It's the context in which that ownership takes place. If you're a country with so little capital that you can't truly modernize the educational level of your whole society, if you have insufficient capital to truly modernize your manufacturing sector and make your society uh, an economy with high levels of labor productivity, if, if you don't have that, you're trapped in a global structure which you puts you in a dead puts you in a dead end. Now, in terms of a political movement uh, that has those goals, of course, in the 1950s and 1960s, the left wing of Indonesian politics indeed had do those goals as a focus. But since 1965, the elite, which is has control in Indonesia, the ruling class, which has different factions, but the same perspective. It's a neo-colonial ruling class, a neo-colonial elite. Someone asked the question earlier in the session, is there any move from within Indonesia for return, I think uh, Chris asked that question, any move for return, uh, demand for the return of the surplus? The answer is no, not from, not from the mainstream of politics, because the mainstream of politics is still dominated by the ruling class that was formed through 33 years of dictatorship under Suharto. You might get an individual voice here or an individual voice there, but the basic thing is accommodation with the global, with Indonesia's position in the global economy. But I think, especially since 1998, even if slowly, in a very difficult process, starting from almost zero, after the, the terrible uh, repression of 1965, and 33 years of political control built on that suppression, including the murder of one million people, and completely, uh, almost total totalitarian, ideological control for 33 years. There are new first forces emerging, even if still at an early stage. And I think we can see that if we, if we look for contemporary struggles for social justice, social change. There are interesting developments in the trade union movement, and there will be a workshop on that uh, at the end of today. Even though the situation in the rural sector is much more, is, is very complex because the situation is very different from region to region, there are many now groups working on land conflict, agrarian issues with an overlap with environmental questions. And there'll be a workshop on that as well. Since the 1980s already, the question of women's rights has <coughs> been, has given rise to more and more organizations struggling for women's rights and women's liberation. And there'll be a workshop later on that as well. And the general thing of democratic rights. <coughs> of course, when Sahata fell, the democratic space in Indonesia expanded greatly. But at the same time, 1965, when Sahata took power, was actually a victory for those forces in Indonesia saying, we, we, we have to integrate Indonesia with the global economy, uh, global economy. We have to accommodate with what they want. And, uh, uh, anyone who's read uh, Jeffrey Winter's books on capital in motion was, can read the chapter about how almost all the major CEOs of the world, plus Sahato's key cabinet ministers, met in Switzerland to design the structure of the, of the economy after 1965. So 1965 in, uh, really closed down <coughs> the debate over, that, over the question of which direction in the, in, the, in the country. After 1998, 
When Sahata falls, democratic space widens up. <coughs> you have what, what, what some people would call liberal democracy. Some foreign academic critics call it illiberal democracy. My own little term is liberal democracy minus. Liberal demo democracy, liberal democracy, liberal minus. Liberal democracy minus. Minus what? Minus that socialist and communist ideas are still formally banned. Basically, the ideologies of the class orientation are still formally banned. So you can say and do almost anything in Indonesia. You can insult the president, say whatever you like, as long as you don't take things in the direction of a class analysis based and class struggle based politics. But I think any response to the neo-colonial objective situation in Indonesia today, any process of merging of a national liberation movement for national development coming into being will come out of the activity <coughs> and the thinking of people involved in these struggles. <coughs> so I think for us in the rich countries, exposing, first of all, exposing the fact that the underdevelopment, economic backwardness, poverty and the string of other problems that countries like Indonesia face is basically neo-colonialism and then neo-colonialism in views of today. To me, that is an absolutely essential argument. A, because it's true, and B, because it helps us rebut the idea of failed races. Because that's what underpins a lot of ordinary people's thinking, and also educated people's thinking. People's, people look at the third world, they look at Indonesia, poor, bad education infrastructure. My wife who's Indonesian works in this, in the, she's, a, she's a playwright and theatre director. There's almost no, for a country of 260 million people, there's almost no modern theatre in Indonesia. No money for it. No money for it. That's the only reason. So people look, people in the first world can quite easily look at these countries. Why are they, why, why is their situation like that? <coughs> if they're not extremely conscious that the origins of that backwardness in the economy and other social spheres is colonialism, then the natural logic is, well, it's their fault. They're a failed nation. Or worse still, which is what's coming stronger now, they're a failed race. They've always had a low income. They will always have a low. Uh, they've always had a low income. They've always been poor. They've always been below us. They've always been behind us. So maybe they always will be like that. And I think one of the key medicines to combat that is to get out there and educate people that the origins of the poverty of the third world is colonialism. That poverty is sustained by neo-colonialism. And the best practical answers to that is first of all, us being more and more active to educate people in the rich, rich countries, especially young people, and I noticed today there are not so many young Dutch people, to educate young people as to that reality, but but also at the same time to be in concrete solidarity with the struggles for social justice and sovereignty in Indonesia as they develop, to be in practical and to do useful solidarity work with those movements. So I'll finish there. Thank you very much. I think it would be nice to have uh, two or three different questions that Max can respond to. Um, yes.
Uh, my question is about uh, 1958. Uh, as far as I know, uh, Sukarno, the PC government, uh, in 1958, uh, nationalized all the Dutch companies in the country, uh, which led also to a. Oh, sorry. Yeah, which also led to a brain drain. Uh, and from a um, emotional perspective, I really understand. But was it rational to to nationalize uh, these companies back then? And um, how did this influence the development of the Indonesian economy? Uh, well, what do you think about that? Thank you. Another question, please. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, in this, in uh, Indonesian uh, historiography, there are always two villain in uh, our in Indonesian history, which is uh, one Dutch and the other is communist. It's always like that. Uh, uh, we were thought about that uh, during our schooling in uh, from elementary to uh, high school that the Dutch and the communists uh, are the feeling. But uh, we cannot say at the same time that before Dutch come to Nusantara, uh, uh, to uh, Archipelago, uh, the, the, the Archipelago was uh, heaven on earth because uh, without the Dutch, uh, there were several atrocities committed by, let's say, by the Makassar to uh, Bhutan Island or uh, racism from Achenese uh, toward uh, Batak Pagan. So those kind of things uh, still happen, well, without uh, the Dutch uh, colonialism. So how can, I don't want to uh, normalize the, the, the atrocity committed by, by, by the Dutch uh, colonial, but how can we put that kind of uh, historical fact into uh, our perspective to, to have some kind of a fairness in, in our uh, history or uh, historiography or historical narrative? Thank you. Is there another comment or question? Yes, one more. Again. Thank you very much, first of all, for your interesting lecture. Yeah. I was uh, wondering, uh, because you uh, uh, you talked about the 1950s, which is the time uh, of the era of Sukarno, and uh, also the time of the, the, new, uh, the new order of Suharto. Um, Sukarno believed in Badikali, means uh, standing on your own feet, you know, as long as Indonesia would still be economically dependent on the West, then there is no such thing as real freedom, because you still would be a neo-colonial country. You know, you, would you, you, maybe you have... Uh, you have broken the, the shackles, but uh, the yoke is still around your own neck. So he believed in, uh, you know, he, uh, he nationalized uh, fortune uh, companies, and he wanted to uh, uh, make sure that Indonesia would be, you know, uh, economically uh, independent. But when you look at uh, the time of Suharto, of the, of, uh, the new order, people always say that during the time of Suharto, there was economic uh, prosperity. The Indonesian people were making, you know, having a better life comparing to the time of Sukarno. What is true about that? Because all the, you know, the graphs and all the, the numbers, statistics, they show that. So I just wonder what is, I mean, if you compare those two eras, would it, would it be, I mean, if, if uh, Su Sukarno's political line would be continued, what would be the difference if you compare it to the time of the new order of Suharto? And my second question is, um, you said that uh, you know, a way to solve this uh, situation of in Indonesia that uh, uh, you know, the Indonesian uh, nation, if it wants to uh, you know, develop uh, Indonesian wealth should be returned. And a mass <coughs> movement in Indonesia should be, uh, you know, should be created. I mean, how realistic is that? And with the current Indonesian political system, would that be possible? I mean, I think that you need, you also need a government who would support such a movement. I mean, uh, getting back your wealth, uh, I would say that, uh, you know, a, a government of a nation should be involved with that. I mean, how possible is that with the current situation, with, I could say, still a neo-colonial mindset 
with Venetian authorities? Is this like a long-term project, or is this, for the moment, being just uh, an idealistic, uh, well thought? Those, well, those are my questions. Thank you. So, questions on nationalization, on the pre-colonial times, on Soberto, and on the re how realistic asking for money back is. The question about the nationalizations in the 1950s and also the last, the first part of the last question about uh, differences in economic conditions between the two eras, the era before 1965 and after 1965. The issues relating to that are connected. The first thing, again, we're not going to be able to understand Indonesia today or anything that's happened without very clearly grasping the history. 1950s. The Dutch bureaucracy and army, but not Dutch capital, left Indonesia in 1950. And in 1950, the situation that applied was captured in those figures, but worse still because they'd gone through the Japanese occupation and the Dutch colonial war. Anybody who expects that within five or six or seven or eight years, you're going to have a booming economy under those conditions, it's a fantasy. So it's not, uh, not the economic conditions that applied in Indonesia in the 1950s and early 1960s had nothing to do with Sukarno's outlook on the economy. They were all to do with the economic the legacy of Dutch colonialism, which was yesterday. In 1950, it was yesterday. Now it's, you know, 70, 80 years, whatever it is later. But 1950, it was yesterday. You can't uh, begin to understand the situation without, first of all, grasping that. Secondly, you, I think, in my mind, most of the textbooks are wrong in the way they describe Indonesia between 1950 and 1965. Most of the history textbooks, I don't know about the Dutch language ones here, but in English language ones used in England, America, Australia, the textbooks will say, from 1950 to 1959, you had parliamentary democracy. From 1959 to 1965, you had guided democracy. At a superficial level, that's true. But it's only at a superficial level. If you want to describe Indonesian politics and, as a consequence, Indonesian society between 1950 and 1965, it was a society, a country, characterized by a life and death struggle about which way the country would go. Now, I remember reading works by an anthropologist who was in Indonesia in the 1950s. Uh, today, if I go to, uh, if I talk to an Indonesian, uh, somebody from Indonesia, please stand up, one person. Uh, Dari mana? Bandung. Ah, see, I asked her where are you from? She answered Bandung. If I read the ethnographic work of people in the 50s, someone who, uh, someone who, if they were asked where are you from, Dari mana, they wouldn't answer Bandung or Samarang or Medan. They answered, KNE, Nationalist Party, Communist Party, Socialist Party, Masjuni. They answered by, sa by saying, I am from this or that ideological current. Why? Just try and imagine again. I mean, it's hard to imagine now, even for Indonesians, because so much is happening. But we have to use our imaginations and understanding of history. A country, a people, has just gone through 50 years of struggling for independence. People have died in the struggle, been imprisoned in the struggle, suffered in the struggle, but win. They have won their precious goal, independence. So it's not surprising that when you get your new country, you think, I have my new country, what kind of country do I want it to be? Communist, socialist, Islamic, social democratic, whatever, whatever, whatever. 
you're passionate about what you want your country to do. From 1950 to 1965, it was the competition and conflict between these passions that dominated the country, not Sakano's ideas. Sakano's ideas had growing support, but the, the character of the country itself was a country characterized by competition between these passionate commitments to different ideas. <coughs> and in 1965, when Suharto and the military came to power and killed the million people, those passions were decimated, suppressed, squashed, pressed underground. Which, which ideology would win? Which direction would win? The army decided with violence. So I think <coughs> to compare the Indonesian economic statistics after 1965, with before 1965, it's, it's not really a useful comparison. It's only in 1965 when one perspective has the opportunity to implement its perspective. Sukarno never had the opportunity to properly in implement his perspective, never. Even in 64, 65, he was basically a minority in his own cabinet. Communist Party, his biggest supporters were not, did not have any serious positions in the cabinet. Uh, whether his policies, if continued up instead of Sahadas, would have resulted in a better situation, I think that's too much specula speculative and depends on what all the different political actors would do. Now, the other question. Uh, uh, how can we be fair when we talk about colonial atrocities and atrocities before the colonizations colonizers came? Well, am I, am I allowed to use crude language or not? <laughs> ba basically, yes. Feudalism and colonialism are both shit, including the feudalism that existed in Europe. Not to mention the capitalism that also developed in Europe. The Industrial Revolution in England was based on, to a large extent, the use of child labor on a mass scale. Uh, feudalism in Europe was bloody. There were tons of massacres. So yes, if you want to be fair, we can say that feudal rule and colonial rule are both shit. But I don't think that uh, I think that's how you've got to see it, between the behavior of feudal ruling classes and then later on the behavior, behavior in the colonies of the Dutch ruling class, the British ruling class, the French ruling class, and Australia had a small colony in Papua New Guinea, didn't do, it, didn't do anything just as bad. All these ruling classes' behavior for two to three hundred years in the areas of the world they've conquested. That's what's been the determining factor in terms of the current uh, situation. The last question, this question of the kind of struggles that, and movement that, I've, that I concluded with saying is necessary, is it realistic or is it idealistic? Well, personally, I think it's necessary. That's my starting point. You saw the figures. I mean, put aside questions of, you know, what what's my ideological orientation, what's your ideological orientation, whatever, whatever. Just look at the facts. Indonesia has a per capita income of between three and four thousand dollars a year. And will at that basis will never have the capacity to modernize its economic uh, socio economic. It's, you look at any economic study, it all indicates that as industrialization develops further and becomes more computerized, etc., etc., the amount of money you need to modernize is huge. Beyond the capital accumulation that's possible in Indonesia at the moment. There has to be global restructuring, and countries, nations like Indonesia, have to struggle for that global restructuring. I think that is the kind of thinking that will develop in the labor struggles, agrarian struggles, 
women's struggles and others that are already starting to evolve. Not everyone thinks like that in these struggles, but I think that's the direction in which we'll inevitably go. Will it succeed or not? Is it realistic to think? Can see, put in place, you talked about governments, put in place a different kind of government. Can it succeed? Well, in the end, that's a question of what everybody does, what we do, what we can convince other people to do. If we, if we try to assess this situation <coughs> purely as observers, we will all just become observers to a worsening and worsening situation for billions and billions of people. We can't be observers. We can't ask the question, is it realistic or idealistic? We must ask the question, is it necessary? And if it's necessary, then we should be working as hard as we can to get there. That's my answer to the last question. Thank you very much. We can't be observers. Um, should we do another round of questions? Are there comments or questions that anyone has in addition? There's one here. Any others? Okay. okay. We'll do one more quick round and please try and keep the questions short. And also note we're doing workshops after the next panel so we, we can go into more details on these topics there. So three <coughs> questions. <coughs> Hi, I uh, just uh, wanted to elaborate more about the, uh, when you mentioned about solidarity uh, within the imperialist country, uh, who are this party that you are expecting to give a solidarity and what kind of solidarity that you actually, uh, like a, in a realistic way? Because uh, I think all, I, I agree the neo-colonialism is still happening until today, but that's the way it is, I think. Uh, the European government, the parliament just uh, banned the, the palm oil industry to enter the Europe. I think that's like a, a easy example, not because uh, the uh, violation of uh, human rights or animal abuse, but uh, simply because I think the government of Indonesia uh, wanted to do to improve the downstream of industry, so the oil basically become expensive, and European people doesn't like that. Thank you. <coughs> two questions here. Uh, thank you. Uh, I uh, have two questions. First, uh, you mentioned about uh, several examples how colonial legacy is still applied today, political aspect, economy, social. And my question whether you also observe that uh, there's also several attempts from Indonesians scholars, activists, that really trying to go away from the colonial legacy, try to make a break to the colonial legacy. So I think there are many. But how, how do you, what do you, I mean, how, do you, how is your observation on this topic? For instance, in agrarian uh, movement, there are also attempt to get away from the uh, colonial legacy in the forest area, for instance, because the forest until now still Still, still, still like the colonial periods because the states own all of the uh, uh, forest land until now, and the forest land is seventy percent of the Indonesia uh, uh, area. And and also in, edu in the education, for instance, why there is no much Indonesian scholars that are really talking about post-colonial studies, for instance? Uh, why? If the colonial studies still, if the colonial legacy still apply in Indonesia, but based on your observation, why there is not much Indonesian scholars that really deal with this issue? If you compare, for instance, in India or in Latin America, and uh, the second question about the colonial practice uh, in agrarian capitalism, I think that is the most important thing. The 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 backbone of colonialism is the agrarian capitalism. And this only post during 1945 until 1965, but then continue again after, uh, with Suharto and until now uh, in the current presidency as well. And in terms of the Dutch, uh, now the Dutch is the 
the highest, the, the, one of the European countries that really have the most investment in, in Indonesia. So all of the European countries, the Dutch is the most country that have uh, investment in Indonesia. But what do you think that it, are they still doing the, I mean, the colonial practice within the Dutch company that operated now in Indonesia, especially in our company, for instance? Okay. Thanks for your talk. It was really uh, interesting. Um, uh, I have a question. I've been working in South Aceh since uh, 2011, and um, I'm wondering your view uh, because I I work in the Alas region, and they have told me that um, once Aceh becomes independent, uh, they would like to also become independent afterwards, so that the Alas region will become independent. Um, my question is this, um, how do you perceive the construct of the Republic of Indonesia in the way it is uh, more countries or more, yeah, how to say it. So Max, you have five minutes to answer all these questions. <laughs> <laughs> Was that five minutes for each question? No, it's at all. <laughs> I think the first question from the, the man here, over here, and from the Jens. Solidarity with who? And you, movements like the Agrarian Movement. I think in my talk, I, I, I sort of, at the end, I sort to uh, say that in terms of uh, an end of the act <coughs> level thinking, a program for a modernization that might emerge, it will come from the it will come from within those movements or with activity connected to it. So I think they're extremely important. That's why we have workshops not only about what people can do in Holland about changing perceptions about colonialism, but also about what's happening in these areas in Indonesia. And hopefully people will go to the workshops and if in whatever area they're, they're interested in and to, so they can start to learn about uh, who to be in solidarity with. But I think even in my country, Australia, we're in the 1980s and 1990s, when we had a lot of uh, inflammation about uh, de political developments in Indonesia amongst Australian activists. We don't have that anymore. And probably, I'm sure, you don't have that here either. So the first step is to educate people to understand what's going on. You can't have solidarity with this group or that group. You can't have solidarity with this trade union or that trade union if you don't know anything about it. Someone, I could say, support this union, support this group. And some people might follow what I say. But you, want, you have to study it yourself. You don't have to become an expert. You don't have to become a specialist. But you must have a basic understanding and knowledge of what the groups and movements are in Indonesia so you can be in solidarity with them. Why not face colonial studies? I think this is a, also not a legacy of colonialism, but a legacy of 1965. Between, between 1900 and 1965, Indonesian political intellectuals were always discussing the nature of colonialism and imperialism. But in 1965, as I said in my talk, my talk that was the moment that Indonesia, with its neo-colonial elite, accommodated to being integrated into the global economy on the West's terms. It accommodated to that. And that outlook, even after Sahato has fallen, has still, is still dominant, even in the universities. Even the most critical people try to find a solution within the current framework. Not questioning the actual underpinning uh, framework. So I think it's a legacy of 65 and it's an ideological struggle by itself to revive that um, uh, to, re to revive that uh, perspective. Do Dutch companies operate like they did in colonial times? No. Do Dutch companies operate like foreign companies operate in the third world in neo-colonial times? Yes. 
to answer that question. Finally, on the whole, the, a very big question, the last one, which I've got what, get down 30, 30 seconds to yes. answer it. Yes. Um, the best books to read on this, in my opinion, are Pramudhyana Tattu's novels, from This Earth of Mankind, Child of All Nations, uh, Footsteps and Glass House which explain the processes whereby something which did not ever exist before, namely Indonesia, starts to come into real existence. I don't think, if you ask, is Indonesia artificial? Yes. What does artificial mean? Made by human beings, not natural. Is there any nation on the planet Earth which is not artificial, that is made by human beings through a historical process? I think the, the processes that took place in the late 19th century and early 20th century gave a real, genuine reality to what uh, became called Indonesia. But I think after 1965, in my opinion, the Sahato regime was one of the most a-national, anti-national regimes on earth. I, I only have 10 seconds, yes. so <coughs> to just give one example of this which symbolizes this non-national, non-national, a-national, anti-national uh, perspective of the new order government. Indonesia is a big, serious country, but it is the only country in the world where Indonesian literature is not taught in schools, where its own literature is not taught in schools. You can go to primary school, junior high school, senior school, since Sahato, not before Sahato, but since Sahato, <coughs> and you will not ever get the opportunity to read and discuss Indonesian literature. And in this international uh, atmosphere, <coughs> regional <coughs> identities get strengthened. And all of the genuine real processes that took place from 1900 to 1965 uh, have, have been weakened. But I think the Indian <coughs> struggle, the labor struggle, women's struggle is going to recreate a national outlook. Because none of the problems of the farmers, none of the problems of the workers are going to be solved except with national solutions. And I think <coughs> that process of thinking about national solutions will also revive. Uh, a, a deeper sense of, Indo of the Indonesian nation. So I'll finish there because I think you have the answer. I've got zero seconds. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Max.